Excellent. Thank you for coming to what is the Weave uh, user group. This is our online Weave user group. Uh, our company, as you can see on the bottom logo, is Weave Works. So this is our user group. So if this is your first time, thanks for joining. If you've come to these in the past, thanks for coming to our first um, Weave user group of the season. Uh, we've kind of done a spring and fall seasons. This year we've been um, regrouping and doing different stuff. So this is our first of sort of a summer and into the rest of the year season. So thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Tama O Nakahara. Uh, I'm head of DX at Weaveworks. And today our speaker is Lee Kapili, who is uh, one of our newest members in the developer experience team at Weaveworks. Uh, he's a developer experience engineer, and I'll go into a little details about that. Uh, and you can see on the screen, we have um, Stacy Potter, who is another um, fairly new member of our team. She is our community manager. So with that, um, I'll jump ahead. So here's a little bit about Weave Works. Um, so we are a company um, that is in the Kubernetes space. Uh, we're based in London, San Francisco, Berlin. Uh, we're building out a team in New York and we've got a distributed team around the world. Uh, I see the RabbitMQ logo here because if any of you have heard of RabbitMQ, um, our founders, our CEO and CTO and some of our engineers and members come from RabbitMQ. They're the guys who created RabbitMQ and the business around it. Um, they sold it to VMware uh, and then fast forward, they saw all these various needs in the container space and uh, started creating pro open source projects and then the company that is now Weave Works. Uh, we are um, a VC that's funded by Google Ventures, um, Excel Partners. Um, we also got some funding from AWS. So um, we are on our way. So this is our backing and you'll see some of the um, bits that are important about the Google part as well, obviously, because we're in the Kubernetes space. Uh, our company is founded on open source. Uh, if any of you know our history, we started with WeaveNet and then we started building out other uh, open source projects, uh, Cortex, Flux, Scope, and the latest is Weave Flagger. And some of you may, may know Cortex as well, which is um, sort of our um, improvement upon Prometheus that is, makes it scalable um, and um, uh, you know, more user friendly in certain ways. And now, Hopefully my slide will progress. I'm sorry, I'm having some slide delays here. Uh, so we're um, adding products to our feature set. If some of you know, we've had a product called Weave Cloud, which is a SaaS product that helps you do management, monitoring, and automated deployments. Um, in a way, it's hosted Prometheus or Cortex that you guys know, uh, and some of the other elements that then work together and some of the core products um, features there are the visibility um, that you get approved upon scope and then more importantly you get automated deployments that are based on metrics that you get from Prometheus. Um, and now we're actually building out as a product what we're calling Weave Kubernetes Platform um, and part of that is that Weave Cloud uh, runs on Kubernetes on AWS. So we've been having um, four years of running Kubernetes in production to run Weave Cloud. Uh, and to do that, we created this um, Kubernetes um, layer to, um, on that pro for that product. And now we've been productizing that. And very soon, we'll be coming out with Weave Kubernetes platform. So if any of you are looking for a GitOps friendly way to run Kubernetes and you need a platform for it, please come ask us questions. And a lot of times some people need some kind of help to get us there. So we have consulting training and support to get you to where you need to go with Kubernetes. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have four years of um, experience of running Kubernetes in production. So we know quite a bit about that. So weave.works is our website. So thanks for your patience and listening about that. Uh, and so yeah, come check us out. So oh, just a touch of housekeeping, as I mentioned, Lee Kapili is the speaker today. My name is Tom O. Um, the duration is we've bookmarked an hour, but um, usually um, the presentation is about 20, 25 minutes, and then we have Q&A, and then we'll sort of just take it as we go. Sometimes we like hit the very end and you know we can't answer all the questions, we'll do our best. Sometimes um, it's nicely encapsulated into about a 30 or 45 minute session. Uh, we're using a platform called Zoom, uh, and uh, if you need to ask questions, please use the chat box. 
Uh, if you can't see it, sometimes you can hit escape and that will give you the visibility of the functionality in Zoom. And hopefully you can see the button, which usually is on the top left corner of your screen. Um, and when you're chatting, depending on the version of Zoom that you have, please make sure that you send to everyone or sometimes it's to all panelists and attendees. And so that way um, everybody can see your questions. And sometimes people in the audience know the answer and so they jump in and answer questions or start having a conversation on the chat. So please um, make sure that everyone can see your question and answers. Um, unless you have something that's burningly personal and private, then yes, you can just send um, a message to me or to Lee. Um, but otherwise, please send to everybody. Uh, and this may not, be um, important for everybody, but if you are copying and pasting um, links or shortcuts to people, if you are using um, Zoom and Safari, then sometimes there's issues there, but hopefully that's not a problem. Um, so with that, um, oops, I will move forward and hand it over to Lee. So Lee, if you want to share your screen, um, let me know if I need to stop sharing first or if you can just take over. Well, it looks, looks like it might be working now. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Lee. Uh, I, I try to start out by showing an obligatory picture of my dog, just because it's very relatable. And I want everybody to get something valuable out of this presentation. And um, oh, it looks like it's not going full screen right now. Struggling to uh, present. What is happening here? Here we go. And this needs to go full screen. It looks good to me. I can see it full screen. Mm, yeah, it's not yeah. like full, full screen. You know what I'm saying? Well, you just have some bars. I think we're good. Yeah. OK. Anyway, uh, my name is Lee. I contribute to Kubernetes. I work with the awesome DX team here. And I just wanted to start it out a little bit with some introductory content. Uh, if you are you know, in the audience and you're attending because you're looking for a way to get started with this thing that people have been talking about called Kubernetes, and you're like, what is it and why would I even want to use it? I really highly recommend the Katakoda Labs. Uh, in Katakoda Courses Kubernetes, there's 17 different labs, and I've curated a collection of 10 of these labs uh, that I'm posting as a comment to the meetup group right now. And uh, I guess my post is too long, so I need to truncate this a bit. There's that. And then in an additional reply, there's some additional links. So what I find is really important is if you are wanting to run workloads in a more resilient way and get started with the platform, it's really important to get your hands on it. If you're a dev, you're a CTO or a business person, and you're trying to understand the value of what Kubernetes provides, uh, the Katakoda platform, in my opinion, is one of the easiest ways to go through labs. I've also linked playwithkates.com. And they have various levels of uh, kind of competence uh, that are prerequisites to going through these labs. This one's the very beginning one uh, that I think people should start out with, uh, which is just using kubectl with a cluster. Um, you do have to log in. It's free. You don't even have to like go check your email. Um, I think they're just trying to prevent abuse. And then you'll see here that you get a terminal uh, in which you can you know do whatever you want. But uh, these environments are curated so that it's very easy to start up a Kubernetes cluster. In this case, they're using Minikube, which I've linked in the docs. You can use Minikube on your laptop. Uh, you can also use another piece of software that I've linked called Kind, uh, which is my preference. And the prerequisite for using that is just Docker and Go. So when you hit Minikube start, it's going to actually pull up all of the resources that are necessary to run Kubernetes onto the machine from over the internet. Kubernetes is a collection of microservices that you deploy on lots and lots of computers. And what it does for you is turn pools of compute into something that can be controlled by a single operating system. Right? So on our laptops, we like to run Windows or Mac or Linux. 
it's an operating system that prevents you from having to choose what CPU cores, you know, your Chrome browser runs on or, you know, like it, it'd be difficult if you had to allocate some RAM for every single program that you wanted to run. An operating system allows you to do many different tasks uh, as a user and it abstracts away the hardware from you. Uh, also does networking things for you. It makes sure that uh, you are privileged uh, to the proper amounts. So if you have different users that are using a single computer, the operating system is taking care of all of that for you. So Kubernetes is an operating system, not just for one computer, but designed to be used in a data center for lots of computers. It can allow you to schedule your workloads. You can abstract away the hardware and stop worrying about where to run them and instead couple your workloads to declarations about just needing a certain amount of compute or a certain number of devices. Uh, is that making sense to people? If not, please do ask questions. Um, at any point in this presentation, we're gonna be moving from very kind of beginner content up into some pretty advanced uh, applications of the Kubernetes API. So once uh, your Minikube cluster is started up, which you can see that only took about a minute, uh, you can see that there's a single node in the cluster. So normally, I mean, you wouldn't call a single computer a cluster, but it's just the abstraction. Um, and it's really easy to click through these blabs. So I could copy and paste this and then like type it, oh, well, you see if you click it, right, then it just runs the command. What this is doing here is running a service called HTTP. Uh, well, it's gonna create a deployment and there's gonna be a single replica of this Docker image as a prerequisite to using Kubernetes. Um, some knowledge of Docker is a good starting point. So, and we'll use the kubectl command line tool to be able to see resources in the cluster. So I'm gonna use the word deploy, which is short for deployment. And you can see that there's a service here. If I'm curious more about kind of what's happening in that deployment, I can describe the resource. You can see in here that, um, and I can now put this in YAML instead. So ultimately, this is not a magic system uh, that you can't know anything about. All of these objects are stored in a structured way in what's called the Kubernetes API. And the deployment is a kind of object that's part of this particular API. And it stores a bunch of metadata about like how the name and the creation time and then also the specification from which we'd like to run our deployment. Uh, inside of the spec, there's a template, and this is a sub API object that's called a pod spec, uh, which is basically how to run the basic unit of compute inside of Kubernetes. Uh, that's how you get your containers that are spawned from images. So you can do cooler things. Um, once you've got the compute running, so I said that pods were the basic use, uh, unit of compute. So if I get a pod, you can see there's one pod and that it is correlated with that single deployment. And if we continue to click through, then you'll see that there's another command that they're asking us to run that is going to expose the deployment as what's called a service. So now that the service is exposed, which we can see that, sorry, I'm just gonna alias this. We can see that there's a service that has a bunch of IP address information that hooks it up ultimately to the pod. I'm using this output wide flag right here in order to see more information about the pod that's running. So here we have this IP. This IP is hooked up to the endpoint inside of the service and because of that, we can hit the services cluster IP and see that we're actually, we have a service that's now running on our Kubernetes cluster. So these labs are super easy to run through. Uh, the last concept that I wanna kind of show before we kind of move on is that if I get the deployment, you can see that it's saying it's up to date one and that one is available. That's because if we describe the deployment Oops. You can see here that the replicas have a declaration that one replica is desired. 
one of the replicas that's currently in the cluster is up to date. And there's one total, it also happens to be available in terms of readiness. But we can change that declaration. And so the important thing to understand about Kubernetes is that we don't run it in an imperative or like command based way. I've been using some convenience commands that are exposed from the kubectl command line tool. But all of these are objects that you could check into a Git repository. And these objects have um, declarative fields. You don't say Kubernetes, can I please have two more? You, you say Kubernetes, hey, I, I, I see there's one. Can I please set it to three? And so I can edit the deployment. It's called HTTP. And then I can go down to the spec portion of the deployment and set replicas to be however many I want. I can set it to five. And when I save that, it's not a file, it's an object inside of the Kubernetes API. Then when I go ahead and get the pods, you can see now there's more pods running. This one happened to be four minutes old. And since we've been talking about this for so long, <laughs> there's now more pods in the cluster. And so we're getting away from having to have a person go into a cluster to get to the desired state. And instead, we're asking the system to do that for us. Um, and that's kind of the core design of Kubernetes. So hopefully, we don't have any questions uh, coming in at the moment. Uh, we actually do. Um, one of them is just, I guess, to level set, um, kind of, could you reiterate, what's the value of using Kubernetes? Yeah, so when you're starting to run web services at scale, say you have an internet business, right? You want to sell a bunch of records in an online record store. You're going to need to spread your compute services potentially in many clouds across many computers. And when we kind of first started getting into the DevOps movement, uh, it was a natural response to struggling to manage all of these computers running all of our processes is so that we could serve users over the internet uh, to achieve our business goals. And as companies started to get really good at running online services, a lot of patterns emerged. Uh, one of them being the value of declarative um, runtime instead of imperative mutations of your runtime. So what we just kind of talked about with saying, instead of give me two servers, right? Um, or instead of add two servers, say give me 10. Uh, and then having a system automatically remediate that for you. So Kubernetes is a collection of patterns in agreed upon interfaces that are now available on lots of different infrastructure providers. You can run Kubernetes in your data center on, you know, commodity compute that you buy, you know, from micro center. You could run Kubernetes in Amazon EKS or with COPS in, in Amazon. You can use Google Cloud. And we have the same exact APIs to describe how we want our processes to run because we're using the same operating system. Hopefully that's kind of helpful. Yeah. And really going, going beyond that then, you can stop with the special knowledge that is entrenched in your organization's operational expertise. And you can start with like shared skill sets for patterns that are agreed upon to be lower cost and easier to think about as people. Uh, and that way we can run more resilient systems. So. Cool. Um, so I hope that helped with the person ask the question. So by the way, if people are curious about uh, the chat, if, um, if someone's just sending a message to us, then I resend it with just your initials. So there's also some, I believe, not questions, but comments from SF, um, which was to deploy standard IoT devices and process locally their outputs near real time. And also, I think maybe you were answering the, adding comments to the person who asked the question. Kubernetes mm -hmm. permits custom integrate and custom delivery for large tools. Example, IoT devices, sectorized pods, um, and yeah. helps to manage reliable, flexible tools. So, yeah. Yeah, answer. to that point as well is that a Kubernetes is not just for big businesses. Uh, a lot of these operational practices are practical early on in a startup uh, can help you run your services in a reliable and understandable way uh, that's industry becoming very industry standard uh, and then provides you the architecture to be able to scale out to 5,000 computers. You, know? uh, you won't be that day one or month seven or year two even, 
but maybe by year five, you will have had a good start and you can scale to, you know, IPO scale. <laughs> so. yeah. Cool. Right. Thank you. And thanks for people in the chat. Yeah. Thanks for the question. That's uh, it's awesome. So I'm going to be getting into a little bit more about how to keep services available. And when we're talking about zero downtime, there's some basics to understand. So traditionally, say I'm operating a bunch of servers and a couple of load balancers in you know, some cloud. My ops team has a front end of Nginx load balancers and a back end of some servers or containers running Node.js, right? So here's our app in green on the far right side of the screen. Uh, and you can see the green dots all indicate that they're available and ready to serve traffic. The arrows coming from left to right are ingress from the internet, hitting our load balancers, and then being split, spread out and distributed in some fair way uh, to all of the different Node.js servers. But then, you know, businesses change and we've got development teams that are able to implement new features and marketing just asked us to change the app from green to blue. So we create the artifacts, we get it over to the ops team. The ops team deploys a bunch of blue servers instead of green ones. And the first thing we need to do is start these servers up. Now, while the application is starting, they're usually not set up yet to be receiving traffic. So there is a period of time in which an app is running technically, but not ready or available to be receiving anything and serving requests. It might be cold in the cache, the uh, HTTP handler might be set up, not set up by the application. Your JVM might be starting, right? These are kind of all just common patterns. The process has to do some setup. So the ops team starts the servers and then we're kind of viewing the log messages and it's looking good. Okay. So all the, all the blue servers are now up and running and it seems like they're good to go. So what we can do is we can change the configuration in the middle at the load balancers. But before we start changing the configuration, we got to make sure that we know what's happening. So we start reading the log messages first on each of the app servers. So we don't just want to know what's happening on one server. We got to like keep state of what's happening on all of them, right? So this is where you start to get into like network operation centers, right? Or, uh, you know, people deploying, if you've ever been trying to do a zero time upgrade of your app during business hours, you've, at some point had all of your logs up. So what we can see here is that all of the green servers have got messages coming in uh, and all of the, the blue servers are empty currently because they're not receiving traffic. So now that we know what's going on and we know that all of the servers are ready, we can start shifting traffic over. It's worth noting that an automated system could do these things one at a time, but a human team usually has to operate in several phases to reduce the complexity. So we've actually expanded our capacity of servers to double what we usually are using in order to make this easier. And then we just keep updating our load balancers until we are shifting the traffic over. We're seeing the logs pour into the new servers and we're watching our monitoring. Nobody's getting angry. There's no 500. So overall this deployment's going really well. And at this point you would think that maybe we're done, but we're not yet. And that's because of a concept called connection draining. So in order to actually fully shut down the old servers, we've got to set them a graceful shutdown signal. That's usually done in the form of a SIG term, right? Sometimes it's a SIG hub or some other esoteric thing, or you have to run a command. Uh, but in general, Unix signals are a helpful way to shut down a process. And you can ask your developers to do, you know, close their database connections and finish serving any requests that are, have still been in memory, right? So even if requests are not coming into the app servers, we have these arrows going right to left that represent that potentially some HTTP responses still need to be delivered back to your users, right? So no new requests are coming in, but some of the requests from before we changed the load balancers were still trickling in and those servers have to handle them. Uh, it's really important to note that if you're going to be doing zero downtime, it is a requirement of your software lifecycle that your app is able to serve traffic from two or maybe even more than two different versions of your code. 
Uh, this is something that a lot of people don't realize and it can cause some nasty bugs, in, especially in your data layer. Uh, but now once all of these apps have received their graceful shutdown signal, they were no longer receiving any requests. Uh, we made sure of that. And then they've returned all of the requests that they were working on. They're going to naturally shut down by themselves. Um, if something's misbehaving, right, and it's like there's a request that's stuck, you know, for minutes on end, you might manually go kill the server and that one person might receive a 500. But in general, that's kind of the algorithm. Um, this is a traditional ops flow for what's called an AB deployment or a blue, green or red, black deployment. Are there any questions with regard to kind of this model? Like once we've drained the connections, we can get rid of those old servers and now all of our traffic is going to the blue stuff. Um, actually, there was a question from a couple of minutes ago. Is there any CD platform to such deployment? Uh, Spinnaker is an example of something that implements Netflix's opinions uh, in AWS using virtual machines to do this kind of thing. Uh, and then getting into Kubernetes, uh, we can talk about the deployment object, uh, which does this kind of rolling update for you. Okay, cool. So let's talk about how these concepts can apply to Kubernetes a little bit. Kubernetes is made up of lots of objects. These objects declare state about how the system should behave, and then the system tries to correct its behavior to those declarations. And so we have different classes of things. We talked a little bit about the pod. The pod is the unit of compute. Uh, you have some containers running in a pod, and those containers share an IP address. The IP address is doled out dynamically by the cluster. So by itself, it's usually not useful. And, but what we can do is we can collect groups of pods together by their labels in something called a service. And the service will collect all of the IP addresses of the pods. Here we can see one, two, and three into an endpoints object. The endpoints object is managed by the service controller. And then other controllers then can use the endpoint object information in order to configure like node routing, load balancing, uh, and ingress controllers and any other higher level things that you're running inside of the cluster. And so this is kind of the, the basic set of things that we need to set up routing to collections of backends using some front end. Um, in a data center, these kinds of objects, you know, are, would be represented by hardware in a cloud, like you might think of this as an auto scaling group and an ELB uh, or you know, Google Cloud's load balancer and a, a set of backend virtual machines. But in Kubernetes, we're using containers, pods, services, and endpoints. Uh, here, this uh, diagram is just to demonstrate that if, say, a pod becomes unhealthy, such as this third one, uh, that the service will refuse to select it and the endpoints will only have the addresses from the two healthy pods. Uh, this happens asynchronously. But in general, it's a very beneficial thing. If Kubernetes notices that one of your processes is unhealthy, it will try its best to not route traffic there. So that is a value add thing for your business. Uh, this is a little bit more of a complex diagram that just shows the interaction of the node and a component called kube proxy, which configures routing rules on the node in order to turn what's called the cluster IP of the service into a virtual IP that load balances to different backend pods. And all of that is just happening through controllers in the cluster that are asynchronously operating on the endpoints object. There's no form of synchronization in the API, which introduces a little bit of a problem for us, which is that pod shutdown is not in sync with what's happening in the network of your cluster and that the order in which things play out in your clusters networking are kind of dependent on your environment. Uh, are you in a cloud? Uh, what are the like sync times of different controllers running in your cluster that are reconciling state? Uh, and the fact that the API wasn't designed to synchronize these things encourages us to respond to certain issues that by default aren't dealt with. And so the goal of this second half of the presentation is to empower you with the tools to not only run your services in Kubernetes, but do it in a way that's not dropping traffic all of the time. Uh, 
basically pod shutdown in Kubernetes is a very normal thing because Kubernetes will run your workloads anywhere it, they need to be run. You can go in and you can rip down a node for maintenance and you don't have to think so much about what that's going to do to your workloads. If you rip down a node and one of your replicas was running on that node, then Kubernetes will find a new place to run it. And in general, since you should be running with multiple replicas, you can rip down nodes pretty much whenever you need to in a scheduled maintenance. And your services will remain running and up because the services will always be selecting pods and routing traffic to places where they can be served. But you have to get the life cycle right. So what happens in a shutdown? Since it's so normal, we should know what, you know, what uh, trade-offs this kind of algorithm is putting on our behavior. So the API server inside of Kubernetes is going to receive a delete and that pod's going to be marked as terminating. The asynchronous consequence of the termination state is that it's going to be removed from the endpoints list. But immediately, you know, just aside from whatever's happening from the service controller, the pod is going to receive uh, the rest of its life cycle. And so if we've supplied pre-stop hooks, which are not by default like available, then those are gonna run immediately. And then after that, what's kind of hard coded into the life cycle is that the PID one of all of your containers in your pod are gonna receive a termination signal. And then if they uh, haven't terminated by themselves within some grace period, which is by default 30 seconds, but you can change it, then they're going to receive a kill, which is a brutal signal from your uh, Linux kernel in order to have the process shut down. And uh, it's going to just get ripped out. So the first gotcha, uh, since we've talked so much about the importance of signal handling here, is that if you set up your container image wrong, then your command or entry point might be running inside of a shell. Uh, the, the big gotcha here is if you're using like a bare string instead of using the array and quotations and comma syntax. So you should always be using the array syntax unless you're intending for whatever you put here to run inside of a shell. Because a shell will not by default pass on signals to sub-processes. Uh, this is the responsibility of PID1, uh, which is to act as an init system for all of your processes. You can also use something like tiny uh, or S6 to do this. But yeah, be careful about that. The second thing is that we talked a little bit about how SIGTERM is the default and hard-coded shutdown into Kubernetes life cycles, uh, pod life cycle. There's an exception to this, which is that if you're using Docker or ContainerD, and I'm not sure about other runtimes because this is non-standard behavior, if you override stop signal in your Docker image layers, then instead of sending sig term, the container will receive whatever stop signal you provide. Uh, so you can specify like sig hub here. Um, say if you're using a load balancer like Nginx that does graceful shutdown on that signal instead of sig term. Um, yeah, this is, this is not formally supported by the CRI. Um, I would assume that cryo probably does this as well. Either way, it's a gotcha. Um, but the next important thing to understand is whenever you're running an HTTP workload in Kubernetes, if you want it to be highly available because of the different life cycle in processes, right? So when I start my Node.js server, it's not ready to receive requests immediately um, or my Java process or whatever you want to set up some readiness and liveness probes. This is part of the Kubernetes pod API. And basically, all of the time, Kubernetes, over some period of checks, will run your liveness and readiness probes to determine the state of what the processes running in your pod are. So it can determine if they are ready to receive signals and even if they should live, uh, sorry, ready to receive traffic. And uh, so the liveness is used to check if the process is just okay. Um, if your process has frozen up uh, or something bad has happened to where it's no longer responding to HTTP requests in a reasonable amount of time, then Kubernetes will mark your pod for deletion uh, and a new one will come to replace it. 
So uh, if you are having an application that runs into memory issues or something, this can be uh, something that can save you. And then readiness is determined, uh, is used to determine if a pod should receive requests. So um, one major gotcha here is you need to be very intentional with the timeouts and the periods that you're using for these probes. For instance, if your readiness probe is kicking in after your liveness probe, then it's effectively useless. The API is not gonna stop you from configuring that, so you should be intentional. Uh, in general, your readiness probe should kick in way before your liveness probe so that your application has a, a chance to recover and you're not thrashing and starting up lots of pods. So. Okay, to pause for a question. Yeah. Um, would exec work with CMD for the process to have a PID of one? Yes, exec uh, is going to be run in the same process, uh, in the same PID namespace, but uh, it's not going to be PID one in your container. Uh, and that is done by the kubelet. Okay. Um, and then there was a question that we just missed in the earlier stage. So either you can answer it now or maybe yeah. take it at the end is, yeah, I would love to you, it. what do you do about database changes across multiple versions? So this was kind of um, about 10 minutes ago. We just missed it. But. Uh, when you're talking about... Before you kind of went into the this. different gotchas, yeah. Yeah, so this particular state right here, um, when we talked about your app being able to serve multiple versions of, uh, serve requests to your customers without downtime using multiple versions of your code, uh, usually you're gonna wanna use uh, some combination of feature flags and database migration here. Um, so in a database migration while you're in this state, which can get kind of complicated, um, your app needs to be migrating data uh, either before this starts or during the process. And then you need to be able to read from both of those tables uh, while your app is running. Um, it's not a simple problem. That's like the, the gist of it, but uh, hopefully that's helpful. Um, a lot of, in terms of like practical Kubernetes application, I've been on teams where we've used jobs prior to the update that will prepare, like run the Django migration scripts or you know, uh, your, your Rails migration scripts beforehand so that your app is able to serve from both versions. Thank you. Uh, and a job is a special type of Kubernetes object that will make sure your pods run to completion, so. That's helpful. All right, so the fourth gotcha, this one's fun um, in, uh, previous versions of this presentation, it's been hard to express why this is an issue. So I drew some pictures. Um, the reason that you need to use pre-stop lifecycle hooks, this is like probably one of the most important things that I'm saying in this presentation, uh, is because service networking inside of Kubernetes and, and in all of the consequences of that, such as ingress controllers, it's not synchronized with pod lifecycle. Uh, this is a classic gotcha, even with mature teams in production, is whenever they update their app, for some reason, a small percentage of their traffic receives like 503s, uh, which is kind of the canonical response code for when a backend like was sent a request and then suddenly became unavailable for no reason. Uh, so it happens deterministically because of that lack of synchronization, it creates race conditions. Um, if you use a pre-stop lifecycle hook, you can prevent this from happening. And here's the picture. So we've got service and endpoints. We have a healthy pod. The pod has an IP address that goes into the endpoint list. Nodes and ingress controllers in your cluster and other network policy things, they are updating from the endpoint list. And they, they get that information and then are routing traffic to that IP. But then the pod gets marked as terminating. And asynchronously, it gets removed from endpoints. This usually, usually happens super quickly. Uh, and it might even be so fast that while your pod is doing its graceful shutdown, maybe a node notices to stop sending traffic there, right? Or maybe it just happened that randomly that node wasn't picked anymore. And so even though the IP was in the process or in the routing table, uh, it just didn't happen to send anything there. But then your pod decides, hey, Everything looks good. I'm not receiving connections at the moment anymore. I'm gonna shut down. Um, I sent every, all of my responses back to the clients that were waiting for things. Uh, all good. 
but there are other nodes and perhaps even your ingress controller that have not updated yet. And they're like, hey, I got a new request. Let me go send it to that pod. But it's not there anymore. Kubernetes has already deleted it. The process doesn't exist. The IP address isn't there anymore because it's dynamic. And so you're in this really bad state where we had a, a backend before, a request came in, the backend was chosen, and then now the only thing that your ingress controller can do is return a 503 to the user saying, um, something really bad happened. You could also maybe do some circuit breaking to prevent this, but the real solution is to make sure that the pod does not shut down before the nodes and ingress controllers update from the endpoints. And you can do that with a pre-stop lifecycle hook. So the solution is to usually, and like here's what's happening is eventually that that goes away, right? But um, so this impedance of like, usually applications are configured to stop receiving connections on graceful shutdown. But what Kubernetes really means is, hey, when I start shutting a pod, shutting a pod down, please drain connections for a short period of time. And this is dependent on your environment. Um, in UWSGI, you have to also do weird things like you have to update the SIG term handler because um, UWSGI by default restarts its processes on SIG term. So there's a link there uh, to a GitHub issue where it's like completely undocumented. These are like awkward war stories from production. Uh, Nginx also, you need to update stop signal to SIG hub in order for it to do the proper thing. But either way, regardless of whether you're using UWSGI or Nginx or some Golang server that you wrote, uh, in general, the production solution to this is to run bin sleep inside of a pre-stop hook. Uh, for, you know, you might find three or five seconds or maybe 15 seconds is appropriate for you in order to drain all the connections and make sure that all of your nodes uh, can get updated to make sure that the IP doesn't exist anymore, that all your ingress controllers are updated to stop sending traffic to that pods. And um, this is a little awkward, honestly, as far as the solution goes, um, to suggest using sleep in production, uh, but just trust me on it. And if you decide to include these durations inside of your app instead, just be mindful to make that configurable since it's leaking a platform abstraction into your code. Um, what makes it awkward is you might choose to do that because otherwise you have to include a sleep binary inside of your container, uh, which if you are using a from scratch container, then you might not have that. Uh, you could copy it in from an Alpine layer or something. Um, I think that maybe we should propose an addition to the pods API that actually lets you use a sleep hook instead of just exec or HTTP um, since it's just such a generic need. But since this is an API change to core Kubernetes API, um, that's not going to happen soon. So, um, hope, are there any questions on that? It, this is really important. You need to sleep in a pre-stop hook if you're running services on the internet. Cool. See any questions in the chat? Looks good. All right. Uh, gotcha number five. This one's a fun one. If you've copied a deployment configuration from somewhere and it's not using V1, then it defaults to um, max unavailable pods equals one. If you're using only one replica, then your deployments uh, will not be zero downtime because it'll rip down the pod before it adds a new one. Uh, the fix here is to either manually declare a percentage or to just use the updated version of the API, which uses 25%. So um, there's a issue link if you're curious about that. But that has caught us before. Um, you'd be surprised how common using the older API version is. So fix those. Uh, just grep your code for apps v1 beta or v1 alpha and then make sure that all your deployments are v1. Um, and then also on deployments, make sure you're configuring these periods and surge uh, to be in line with capacity and how long it takes your app to reasonably warm up without uh, being a latency consequence to the majority of your users. So. If you min ready seconds dis determines how long uh, in a phase of your rolling update, something needs to be up before Kubernetes moves on to rolling out more of the service. So uh, if something can't be ready for 30 seconds, right, or seven minutes, um, then Kubernetes will stop rolling out. And um, you can use that to delay how long your rolling updates take in order to make sure that your app rolls out more smoothly 
and doesn't cause latency spikes. Uh, that there might be many reasons for that. A lot of it is uh, memory locality and cache warming. So, and then uh, progress deadline seconds is uh, if you increase min ready seconds, then you probably need to increase this number. So. And then the seventh one, uh, this is where I get to rant about sidecars. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about how sidecars are a really creative solution. Um, they also break some semantics of Kubernetes. Uh, one is that shutdown lifecycle is per container uh, inside of your pod, which means that if you've got multiple containers in a pod, you need to do either some kind of scheduling or synchronization between multiple containers. A common example of this is like having a database proxy that offs you to your cloud providers managed database service. Uh, cloud SQL proxy is a Google uh, implementation. And basically, if you forget to configure your pre stop hook on both cloud SQL proxy and your app, then your app will stay open and cloud SQL proxy will shut down before your app shuts down, uh, which means that it's going to drop your database connections on the floor while it's trying to serve requests. So you'll get errors in your error logs and you will have customers who are like, what just happened? Um, especially if you have a stateful service that's connecting to a database, this can be very uh, displeasing. So make sure that if you're using sidecars, you're thinking about how they shut down and you can make sure that they shut down together. Uh, the practical way to do this is again, uh, often with sleeps. You can also share files between your containers and then have the processes talk to each other uh, through those files in order to figure out when to shut down. So again, a very heavy section, uh, but I really want to stress that like Kubernetes is a great tool set for running reliable applications. These are the edge cases um, that will bite you if you do not consider them. And so these are kind of the seven rules of uptime here. Uh, make sure that your entry point is handling and or passing signals to the proper processes. Uh, your stop signal may need to be changed. And then you need to be using different periods of time for your liveness and readiness probes. Once you've got that done, make sure that your HTTP facing services, your customer facing services, and anything that needs to remain available is probably sleeping in a pre-stop hook. And that's necessary to drain connections because of the design of Kubernetes. Um, Make sure you're using apps v1 for all of your deployments um, just so that you don't have to think about it. And keep your app warm during a rolling update. So you may have to configure some times there. Uh, finally, if you're using sidecars, you're going to want to make sure you're synchronizing the shutdown, right? So especially if you're using a service mesh or if you're using database connection processes, which are critical for your applications network path, you're going to need to be modifying those things so that they shut down after your application. And if you follow all of these things, then 99.99999% of the time, uh, everything is going to converge in the proper order so that you never drop any connections for your customers from a practical standpoint. And you will be um, very, very available. And you can do whatever you want to your infrastructure. Pods will shut down all of the time. You can move nodes around. And you'll never have to worry about more 503s spiking in your Kibana logs. So. I hope that these resources are helpful for you. Again, these slides are published on the meetup. Um, of course, you've seen my GitHub and my Twitter have been on the bottom of the slides if you wanna connect with me. And uh, feel free to reach out, my DMs are open. Uh, also, the Weave community Slack is great and everything. And we would love to continue to help you be a resource for you, potentially a partner um, with Weave Cloud or our production Kubernetes platform um, so that you can serve your customers in a way that moves your business forward and in a way that you have to stop thinking about it. So, yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, in fact, yes, we just had a question on whether you're going to um, publish the slides. Um, but then there's a follow-up question with that is, do you have a repo with examples of spec files demonstrating these ideas? I do not, uh, but I can link some resources that do. Excellent. Great. Share my slides. Can anybody see this? That's a that's a really good suggestion, though. I should uh, I should have a file with some highlighted sections so that you can see what it, what a deployment with all these bits looks like. Yeah. 
Hopefully, yes. Yeah, sometimes that can be difficult, but uh, yeah, if that's possible, um, thanks for asking. Um, I'm going to also holler out to um, Stacy since I'm sharing my slides. If there's any other chat stuff, please let me know because I can't see that in Zoom. Um, so thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, if you do have more questions, then please keep asking on the chat. Um, while you're doing that, I just wanted to let you know, again, um, this is the Weave online user group. Uh, our company is Weaveworks, and um, we're kicking this off again for the next season. So today is Thursday, but um, we'll probably be doing these on Tuesdays in general. We're starting to line up our calendar for um, the rest of the year. Um, we're just bookmarked. We'll um, have a couple of GitOps topics in the coming weeks. Uh, we just have to finalize the stuff, so I'm just letting you know. But um, if any of you guys like Stefan on our team, um, we'll probably be back and we'll be covering that topic in the coming weeks. So uh, the best place is to, um, if you haven't joined our Weave user group on meetup.com, that's the best place to kind of know our calendars. Um, again, you saw Lee's uh, contact info. Mine is uh, my email, tomo at weave.works. Uh, and also, yeah, if you haven't joined our Slack channel, we are always happy to help um, with any questions you have uh, or any of these topics getting started. Of course, you probably know about the Kubernetes Slack as well, but um, yeah, the ways that uh, if you have any questions, please come ask us. We're always happy to help. Are there any other questions in the chat? Um, if not, then again, uh, like I said, we've been running Kubernetes in production for uh, four years now, so um, we're always happy to help. Um, we are building out a product that will be coming out soon, which is a Kubernetes platform, in case you want to get started. We have cons consulting and training to um, help with you uh, on that journey. So, Hey, Tomo, it's Stacy. <clears throat> yes. There's a couple of questions that have come in. Lee, oh, I see that you're answering them in the chat. Do you want to just go ahead and, and answer them uh, live real quick? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, JD had a question about whether or not you need service meshes if you have ingress controllers. Uh, I think it's a great place to start if you just depend on your ingress controller for sophisticated traffic management. Um, I don't really like the sidecar approach. Uh, I think that meshes that do not use sidecars are um, in many ways superior for the availability of your services and the management of your cluster because they can be managed separately. Uh, basically, if you need to upgrade your mesh, you need to restart everything in your cluster, which makes it really difficult to use. Um, whereas you could just be rerouting inner service traffic through your, through your ingress controller and that creates a mesh. Um, but uh, for there, there are legitimate needs for service meshes. Uh, it's a serious abstraction that you should think hard about adopting because it's they're complicated to operate and come with lots of gotchas and overhead so um the great question and then um yeah will i publish the slides those things are in a comment on the meetup i i guess i could probably post that in chat as well um and then i think we pretty much answered everything i believe we have yeah give it 30 more seconds any last um, questions if you're struggling in, in the service mess of service mesh, then um, <laughs> Flagger is really great. Uh, our, our DX engineer, uh, Stefan, he wrote that, and it helps you reduce the uh, complexity of operating a mesh. Uh, at JD, do we really need sidecar containers for proxying? Uh, for multi-tenancy needs, some people would argue yes. I think for most people's use cases, a daemon set would work better. Um, can we just use HTA proxy or Nginx instead of things like Envoy or the Rust data plane? Technically, yes. Um, Nginx has been selling meshes for years, um, but Envoy and you know, uh, Linkerd's data plane are built for the task. Um, I, I do think that just using uh, traffic as an ingress controller uh, and then running that with several replicas on a node pool that's destined for routing, I think that that's a good pattern that can scale uh, if you want to be routing your traffic through the traffic mesh. Um, it's, a good, it's a good way to do things. Um, also, a pattern that people have been using in production of, with systems like Puppet for years. Great questions about mesh traffic stuff. Also, uh, I can link an article about some additional gotchas uh, when using Istio <laughs> for the availability of your services. Yeah. 
Well, actually, it would be a great follow-up top two. Yeah, so. All right. Find a call, find a call, find a call. All right. Yes, the slides will be available. They're on the Meetup page. Mm -hmm. And we'll follow up with an email as well. Thanks so much for the great questions. We really want to be a good resource for all of you. So, You're welcome. Welcome, everybody. All right. Well, thanks for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Like I said, check out our Meetup page because we'll be having a full calendar for the rest of the year, and we'd love to see you there. So thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.